So basically tonight I'm going to throw a ton of information at you. Um, it's going to come at you as little pieces of a jigsaw puzzle and they're going to be bouncing all over. And when I'm done, we'll kind of wrap it all up and you'll see the big picture. Okay. Uh, Ted made a couple comments uh, and I'm going to kind of elaborate on that a little bit. <clears throat> you know, I love the Minnesota Vikings. I'm, I'm a fanatic about the Minnesota Vikings. It's so much so my wife's from Minnesota. I married a woman from Minnesota because I love the Vikings, right? Um, every year in the spring, I, I look forward to the upcoming fall season. And typically, I, I stay hopeful that and, you know, the Vikings are going to make it to the playoffs and then the Super Bowl and win the Super Bowl, right? And typically, about mid-October, I find myself to be very disappointed, okay? Uh, the point of that is, being a huge Minnesota Vikings fan, I'm very prideful in the fact that I think that the Vikings are going to win. And in my opinion, in my arrogance, I think that because I support that team, they're the greatest team in the country, right? Same can be said about preparedness. A lot of people in their pride and, and arrogance believe that this is the United States of America. Nothing's ever going to happen here. And if it does, the government's going to be there to help us. Okay? Yet we see every year, at least 5.4 million Americans every year, see that while it is the United States of America, they get disappointed because something happens here. And while our government will be there to help us, they get disappointed because our government's not there as quickly as we need them to be. FEMA says on their website, they have a 72 hour response time to put boots on the ground. That's on their website. They then further that by saying it's an additional 72 hours before we have resources and have been able to assess the needs. It's an additional 72 hours before those resources are able to be distributed among the population. It's nine days. That's our government's response time. Okay? So if we live by the idea that this is the United States of America, nothing's ever going to happen here, we're going to wake up one morning and we're going to be sorely disappointed similar to the way I am about the sixth game of the football season every year, okay? And then when it does happen, if we live by the philosophy that the government's gonna be there to help us out, we're gonna be sorely disappointed, similar to the way I was a couple years back when the Atlanta Falcons ended up going to Super Bowl instead of the Vikings, okay? Point of that story is this. Yes, we live in one of the greatest nations on the face of the earth. I would say we live in the greatest nation on the face of the earth, but I can't because we've murdered 19 million of our citizens in the last 17 years, which is more than Hitler, Stalin, Lenin, a couple others, okay? Um, but we are one of the greatest nations in the world. And, and with that being said, there are a lot of things that our country can do for us when we need them to, but they're not always gonna be there. And we have to do for ourselves. Okay, we're three minutes without air, we're three days without food, I'm sorry, three days without shelter, um, seven days without food, three weeks without water, uh, sorry, seven days without water, three weeks without, without food, before we die, okay? Now the air, there's really not much you can do about that. You either have air to breathe or you don't, okay? Shelter's something that's quick and easy. You can have shelter from a trash can if you need it to be. We can all quickly and efficiently from refuse build some type of shelter. The food is something we have to have. The water is something we have to have. If we don't have it, we're done for, okay? If we are seven days, or I'm sorry, I'm very tired, y'all, I apologize. If we are three days without water before we start to deal with the whole dehydration thing and four or five days before we pass away, if we're 21 days without food before we starve and there's a point of no return in there somewhere around day eight to day 14, depending on your body fat. If we're waiting around, around for nine days for our government to come in and help us, we're kind of uh, in a very bad spot and so are our families. For me, I began prepping because I have a wife and two children and I felt it was my responsibility as a father to make sure that under any circumstance, whether it be the end of the world or whether it be you know a natural disaster, tornado, whatever, whether it be I lose my job, whatever the case may be, I felt like I needed to prepare for any eventuality so that no matter what happened, my wife and my children 
would get through it and be okay. Unfortunately, in that quest of understanding where I need to be for my family and understanding where I need to, what I need to do as far as my preps go, I came across some very scary information, okay? Um, first of all, I am the opposite of Alex Jones. If, if Alex Jones is over here, I'm, I'm way over here. If Glenn Beck is over here, I'm way over here. I, I do not subscribe to conspiracies. Um, I do not believe that the FEMA, the FEMA camps are there to be our concentration camps. I do not believe that the FEMA coffins are there to you know, dispose of the bodies when the government kills us. And I don't worry about drones over U.S. skies because I'm not doing anything wrong. My philosophy when it comes to conspiracies is even if I could prove them, there's nothing I can do about it, right? So why waste time focusing on it? Worrying about whether the dollar's going to collapse or not, worrying about whether they're coming to take our guns or not, none of this stuff really matters as far as keeping my wife and my children fed, clothed, housed, okay? What does matter is knowing when something is coming our way, being able to prepare for that. With that being said, <clears throat> um, several things have become very obvious in our world over the last several years. Uh, if, if we just take a few moments and not watch what's going on with our politics and not watch what's going on with what our media is presenting to us and not pay attention to the sitcoms or the doomsday books and movies and all that kind of good stuff, if, if we tune all of that out and just start focusing on where our planet is in the Milky Way, what's going on with our planet, what's going on in our solar system, what's going on with our sun, if we have a better understanding of how we move through the universe, then we have an understanding of how we got to the point that we're at today, okay? If we do a little bit of study into our history, look at some of the archeology, span archeological science that's come out, archeological facts, uh, if we look at some of the scientific data that's being presented to us, and again, if we can just get past the conspiracies and get down to the truth of that scientific data, we understand that the world is in for a very hard time, and it's coming soon. You know, the days of us sitting back and saying, well, you know, it'd be nice, you know, in a major disaster to have this, or it'd be nice to have that, you know, the days of getting together with friends and saying, well, what will you do under this situation? What will we do under that situation? The days of planning to prepare at a later date are over. They're done. As preppers, we all need to recognize that small, little fact and then move beyond it. We can no longer look at things and go, well, in, over the next 12 months, this is what I plan to, to stockpile, and over the next 24 months, this is what I plan to stockpile. Because folks, we don't have that time. We simply don't. Now, keep in mind in our industry, for somebody to stand up and say, look, the end is coming, and it's coming on this date, and then it doesn't come, it destroys that person in the industry, and I got that. I'm fine with that, okay? Because the scientific data is there. We track natural disasters. When we look at tracking natural disasters, we place a percentage of probability on each of the disasters that we track. There's 19 of them. There are 11 interconnects, meaning that um, with solar energy, when we have a CME impact the Earth, we know that there, it's, it's directly uh, interconnected with seismic and uh, volcanic activity. We know that when a CME hits the Earth within the next 24 to, to 36 hours, we're going to see a, a severe increase in volcanic and seismic activity, and over the next 48 to 60 hours, we're going to see some mega quakes going on. We know this. So when we chart solar activity in the form of CMEs or uh, in, in the form of solar radiation produced by coronal holes, we look at it and we say, okay, well, you know, CME here interconnected to it is the seismic activity and the volcanic activity, okay? With that being said, <clears throat> We track these things and we put a percentage of probability or a pop on each of these disaster scenarios or natural events, and, and we do it on a daily basis, okay? Understanding that events that take place today can affect the outcome of events that are forecasted to happen tomorrow, right? Since 1982, we've been tracking 19 different disaster scenarios on a daily basis and forecasting them for the following year. Every October, we forecast for the following year 
and every year in January, the forecast that was predicted in, in October is different because events each day change the future events, right? Until we got to this year. From October 3rd, when they, when they released the data, until January 1st, there was no change. 2013 was still on track to be exactly like they had forecasted it. And they were hoping for some changes because it's terrifying what the world is going to go through this year. Okay? February 7th, still no change. Everything was happening exactly according to plan. The odds of this are astronomical. It's, it's not even like one in 500 trillion. It's, it's astronomical beyond that, that we could get that many days with nothing changing. And then February 8th, some things changed. February 9th was supposed to be a fairly mild day worldwide. Um, and it was a very devastating day. We had multiple mega quakes, we had tsunamis, we had countries flooding, we had uh, winter storms wrecking havoc in areas that normally don't get winter storms. I mean, it's, it snowed in Israel, it, it snowed in Iraq, it snowed in, in pa uh, Pakistan and in, in India, and not up in the mountains either. We're talking down in the lower levels. People were dying from exposure from snow because they're not used to seeing it. That same week, towns that get you know a foot and a half to two feet accumulation during the course of a year had 27 feet dropped in one place in Russia, 29 feet of snow dropped in 37 hours in one city in Japan. That's a lot of snow to fall from the sky in a very short time, right? And we're seeing this because our weather patterns are changing. Our weather patterns are changing because our magnetosphere is changing. Our magnetosphere is changing because our magnetic poles have moved and they've moved 37.6 degrees. So when we look at these natural disasters and we put a pop on them or percentage of probability, we kind of draw the line in the sand at 80 degree, at 80%, okay? Meaning if there's a 35% chance that tomorrow somewhere in the world there's gonna be a mega quake, which a mega quake is anything 6.8 or higher, okay? If there's a 35% chance of it, we're not overly concerned of it because it's only a 35% chance, right? But yet the odds are it's a one in three, you know, chance that it's going to happen. So I kind of say 35% is pretty good, pretty good odds, but we don't. We look at 80%. That's where we draw the line in the sand. When we hit 80%, a pop becomes a high value percentage or an HVP. When we have two or more HVPs forecasted to take place within a seven day window, it becomes a high probability conjunction or HPC. And if there's interconnected ideas after that, we follow it with an interconnect. Give an example. Let's say that the last eight days of May are, are forecast to be our next high watch time, okay? And that the 28th of May turns out to be an HPC five with interconnect three. What that means is there are, there are five events that all have a percentage of probability greater than 80% of taking place on May 28th and three of those are somehow related to the others. In this particular instance, it deals with the mega quake that follows a coronal mass ejection that is an X-class flare, okay? Because we have the coronal mass ejection and an X-class flare that creates a, a heightened uh, probability of earthquakes as well as volcanoes, and because it's projected where our Earth will be facing the sun when that spot rolls around on the same ecliptic, what we're looking at is, is some type of mega quake taking place somewhere in the ocean. Because of that, we'll have a tsunami that follows. Okay? And guys, tsunamis are not just 200 foot waves that crash into Japan. A, a tsunami can be a one meter event, it can be a 300 meter event. Okay? But because of that, those become interconnected. Okay? So we're looking at HPC 5 with interconnect 3. Now, that doesn't seem that bad until you stop and you look at, well, what else is going on? So here's some numbers for you. September 1996, the first HPC5 event since 1982 when we started tracking this. The very first one, and the only one that year. October 1999, another HPC5 event. We went three years without having one. We went 14 years without having one once we started tracking them. From there, things quieted down until 2003 when we had three HPC5 or higher events. 2006, we had seven HPC five or higher events. 2008, things started to get a little crazy. And this year, there's 69 days where we have HPC five or higher. On February 7th, as we were still following the planned forecast from October, we were looking at November 8th as being an HPC 19 with interconnect 11. We have 19 things that we watch, we have 11 interconnects. 
which tells me that until February 7th, November the 8th was forecasted to be a day when every type of natural disaster we were facing and we were tracking would happen somewhere in the world. This tells me that's a day I want to stay at home. Unfortunately, with the events that took place on February 7th and February 8th, and we elevated things on February 9th, instead of it changing the future events and making them look better, it kind of made them look worse. February 8th was downgraded to an HPC 11. I'm sorry, November 8th was downgraded to an HPC 11. But the 5th, 6th, and 7th were all ele elevated to an HPC 19 with Interconnex 11. The first 16 days, the, all scientists, all the experts agree, whether you're looking at NASA, whether you're looking at the uh, United Nations Space and, and Science Administration, whether you look at their, their uh, Space Council, whether you look at the, the Committee on Earth Change and Climate Change, whether you're looking at the United Kingdom or Australia, they all agree on the same thing. The first 16 days of November of this year, there's not a single square mile on the face of the Earth that will not be affected in some way, shape, or form negatively by a natural disaster. So as preppers, we're kind of sitting back and we're going, you know what, hey, we've been, we've been planning for this, right? But are we really prepared for it? Are we mentally, are we emotionally prepared for it? No. None of us are. How can we be? Who here has survived 14 to 18 days in a major disaster area? Who here's been in a combat zone? Who here's seen the reaction face to face of what people will do when they are starving? Because we all saw it, right? We saw it on, I need to move some of this stuff. We saw it on, um, during Hurricane Sandy, day three, news reporter filming people dumpster diving. Day three, day three, three. I could say that all day long. Three days after an event came through, people were out of food. That's the type of society we currently live in. Out of food and so desperate they were dumpster diving. And in one of the videos that you can still watch on YouTube, which is a news reporter, local news anchor, had the cameras right here filming the reporter. Left hand side, you got the dumpster in the background. A guy stands up shaking a bag of food and the guy behind him hits him over the head with the shovel, takes the bag and jumps out of the dumpster and runs off. In three days, people in New York City went from being normal civilized people to, to diving in dumpsters for food and then hitting people, resorting to violence and hitting people with a shovel over the back of the head to get what they had. And we think that we're prepared for that. We're not. 